Welcome, everyone. So happy to see you. Uh, my name is Dr. Matthew Camp. I am joined by Professor Sonali Rajan from Teachers College, and we're here to take action on gun violence prevention, a very important topic. And so uh, I'm going to give a quick run of show of what to expect this afternoon. Um, I'll drop that in the chat at the same time. And there we go. I, um, right now, we uh, will shift over to Professor Rajan to talk about gun violence prevention research, the latest in the field. Uh, we'll open it up to learn about you here in the room. This is a participatory event uh, to learn what kind of actions you're, you're taking and you've taken in the past. This is the concept of asset accounting to, to build power in the room, to meet you where you are. Uh, we'll shift over at about 1.30 to uh, the letter writing, the phone banking, tweeting, reaching out to our legislators, and then we'll continue with some Q&A uh, and additional kind of crowdsourcing on what actions you're familiar with, what actions you'd like to take, and so on. So without further ado, I'm super happy to introduce my colleague um, at Teachers College, Professor Sonali Rajan. This is, our, I think, our third workshop. Uh, together, unfortunately, fortunately to work with you, but unfortunately on the topic, it's um, it's very challenging and, and, and tragic, but it is motivating us to make a difference. We're starting to see some change happening before our very eyes. So uh, without further ado, Professor, um, why don't you walk us through the latest on the research on gun violence prevention? Of course, thank you so much, Matt. And it's so nice to see everyone here today. I am just really encouraged by you all taking time on a Thursday to spend an hour or so with us uh, thinking about how we can respond as members of our community, as scholars, as advocates to this, um, what I would consider is one of the most devastating social crises of our time. Um, and so I'm really privileged to be here and thank you to Matt and to Sarah and to all the folks who really helped pull this together. I had to do nothing. I just showed up today. So this was really, really um, just a, just happy to be here. I will know, well, I think we can talk about this at the end, but there, um, we did pull together some resources and publications, um, podcast episodes, all sorts of things that um, we will point you in the direction of after today. Uh, so we can build on, um, you can build on your sort of base of resources um, as you continue to advocate in different ways. Um, so as a professor, I could talk for hours about this. That's what professors do best. Um, and so I'm gonna do my very best to give you a, just a few minute overview of what I consider some of the most key aspects of gun violence prevention that we can actively write to our elected officials about. Um, and I'm gonna talk first about a few pieces of policy, some legislative act actions. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about other non-legislative actions that um, I think are important to advocate for, honestly, from a budget perspective. So those of us here in New York City hearing a lot lately about the budgets in our schools and how our funding resources are being allocated. And believe it or not, a lot of those things that have nothing to do with guns themselves, but have everything to do with our schools and our communities, also have a lot to do with preventing gun violence. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes highlighting that. Um, and I am at home today, so welcome to my apartment. Um, but there is a, um, uh, I wasn't able to, to get to my office. So this is this is the background where we're embracing. Okay, so let's just dive right in. So I wanna talk through essentially a few pieces of legislation that the science, and this is something my colleagues and I feel is really important, but we're not just pushing for pieces of legislation that um, we personally feel are important, but rather these are pieces of legislation that if enacted, ideally at the federal level, but even at the state level would be, would be effective at reducing either rates of gun violence in different forms and or the lethality of a given particular of a given shooting and things like that so i'm going to walk through this first so one thing that i think we you may have heard quite there's been a lot in the press about this lately um, these are uh, bans on assault weapons and bans on large capacity magazines so basically magazines that hold more than 10 bullets um, and banning assault weapons 
these have been shown, this type of policy has been shown, not even this type of policy, these policies have been shown to significantly reduce the frequency and the lethality of mass shootings in particular. And I will note that we are here today largely in response to the mass shootings we have seen in Buffalo, in Uvalde, and in other places around the country. But mass shootings are really the proverbial tip of the gun violence iceberg. There are school shootings, um, there are unintentional shootings, there are suicides by firearms, there's uh, community gun violence, there's a lot of different kinds of gun violence. And so I think it's really important to remember that we want to prevent all of these different types of gun violence, right? We wanna consider all of this. Um, just to give you some context for this, since the Uvalde shooting happened just a few weeks ago, uh, over 2,500 individuals in the United States alone have been shot with a gun. So that's like a lot of people, right? A lot of devastated families and communities in a very short period of time. So when we think about gun violence prevention, it is not just about uh, the prevention of uh, mass shootings in particular, but all these different kinds of shootings. So I just wanted to underscore that piece of it. Okay, so we have bans on assault weapons and bans on large capacity, large capacity magazines. Um, we then talk about something called permit to purchase laws. So these are efforts that are known to reduce mass shooting violence. And research has shown, I think this is really interesting, um, Research has shown that in states where gun purchaser, gun purchasers are required to be licensed and fingerprinted before obtaining a gun, mass shootings occur at a much lower rate compared to states without such policy. So I think that's really important to consider. I also want to note, as I kind of just go through this list here, that all of these are policies that work best when we're implementing all of them. So there is no one single policy, no one specific policy by itself that is going to be enough to try and address this as an issue. So we have to think about implementing these policies together because that's how they're going to be the most effective. The next, the next uh, policy that I think is really important to highlight is something called extreme risk protection orders. And this is something that we know, you may have heard this in the news, it's often, they're often called red flag laws. But basically what these um, do is they allow authorities, family members, loved ones to petition a court if a loved one is believed to pose a threat to themselves or others and to request that the person in question be temporarily dispossessed of their firearms. That means if you are an individual who owns a firearm and you, you have a loved one is worried about you, we would just temporarily remove your firearm or firearms from your home. Now, if you think about also what we're describing here, everything we're describing is, oh, oh, oh. Um, is not about taking firearms away or even banning them. It's really about how do we coexist safely and reasonably with the 400 plus million, 400 plus million firearms that are in circulation in the United States? So just to give you some context, there are more guns than there are people in the U U U.S. So we have to figure out how do we coexist with these weapons safely? And I think the large majority of uh, members of our communities and the large majority of gun owners believe that these are reasonable requests. So this is just giving some context for the asks for putting into place. Another piece of legislation that we could absolutely push for, I think is really, really reasonable, is just raising the age to 21 years old. Um, you know, the, we know that a lot of the perpetrators of this type of violence are often 18 years old, we saw this in Uvalde. Um, about 20%, some of the research that my colleagues and I did estimated that about 20% of active shootings in K through 12 schools are committed by individuals between the ages of 18 to 20. So just raising the age to 21 years, we do that for alcohol, we do that for a lot of other things, right? Very reasonable, we could do that here for firearms. Um, and then the last thing I think that could be pushed in terms of like a policy, not so much a policy, but really kind of an investment in public education is something called safe storage. So what that means is if you are a gun owner or a friend or a family member is a gun owner, the goal here is that they should, safe storage means you should be storing your firearms at home safely and securely. So they should be stored locked 
unloaded and separately from any ammunition. This is particularly important for um, individuals for if there's a, a concern about suicide risk. This is also if, if particularly important if you live with children. So I have a six and a half year old and I can tell you that if my family were firearm owners, we would, this is a very basic step that we would take. I think any of us who have spent time with children know the importance of keeping our home safe. This is just one part and one way of doing that. Okay. I also want to add, I just, I also want to understand, so that's, those are some very specific policies, right? Things that we can write to our elected officials and say, these are reasonable, evidence-informed, science-informed policies that we know work that are not about gun control. It's about gun safety. It's very reasonable. And again, at the federal level and at the state level. So those are the first things I wanted to talk about. The other thing I wanted to highlight is that there are other ways in which we should be investing in our communities and in our schools and in ways that we also know are important to reducing gun violence and also improving the well-being of our communities and of our children and of the people that we live and work with. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Several of my colleagues have done really interesting work using the most rigorous science to identify what they call place-based interventions as ways in which we can reduce gun violence in our communities. This includes investing in green space, increasing access to affordable housing, improving street lighting, okay? These are not things that you would necessarily associate directly with gun violence, but it turns out all of these contribute to reductions in community gun violence. They also have the added benefit of improving mental health and well-being, of improving social cohesion among children. Um, these are things that are really important. We also know that in our schools, it's really important that schools are places not just where children can thrive, but uh, not just places as, that are free from gun violence, but also places where children can thrive. So this means we need to increase access to public libraries. We need to um, have fewer punitive, um, punitive disciplinary practices, really thinking about efforts to, how are we, how, what are um, efforts to invest in children so we're not just suspending or expelling fourth graders or 11th graders, right? Which happens all the time, but really thinking about attending to the needs of our kids, we need more act, real access to mental health services, not just be, not, necessarily because someone who is um, not necessarily because we think that um, every single person who's at risk who has a mental illness is at risk for gun for perpetrating gun violence if that's actually not the case but more because it's really important to attend to the well-being and mental health of our communities especially since gun violence is so uh, ubiquitous and we want to be able to attend to and address these issues in the aftermath of a shooting, of exposure to gun violence, et cetera. So investing in school psychologists and social workers, really paying our teachers really well, investing in our school communities in these meaningful ways. I can tell you right now that increasing police presence in schools is not a solution to gun violence. I think it gives the, um, there's no research that shows that that's an effective strategy. And in fact, there is research that shows that criminalizing our school spaces in those ways are actually very detrimental to our children and to their well being. So, if you take all of this together, right, we want to reduce access to firearms among those who may be at risk, among those who are younger than 21. We want to, we want to ensure that we're investing in our schools and in our communities. So, we want to talk to our elected leaders about budget, right, about what's happening on the budget side of things. Where are where are our tax dollars going? How are those being invested? I think these are real questions that we can ask that we should push for in terms of saying we are members of our communities, right? We're seeing this here in New York City right now. There's a real push to uh, increase police presence in different ways and a real, we're taking away from libraries, from swimming pools, from other aspects of our community, right? That can improve the well being of everyone who lives here. So the prevention of gun violence is not just about responding to gun violence in the moment of a violent act. It's really about thinking about its prevention in a much more multidisciplinary, multi-layered, comprehensive way that gets at the root causes of gun violence all the way through actual access to firearms. So it's putting all of those pieces together. I could talk to you about this all day long, but I will pause 
for a moment and happy to take questions before we move on to the next part. Yeah, we have time for just one or two questions uh, from the audience. Anybody have anything they'd like to know right now? Scrolling through everyone's faces. Hi, uh, hi, Professor Sonali. Can I ask a question? Yes, please do. I'm, I'm Aparna Anand. I'm a full-time lecturer at uh, Education Policy and Social Analysis at DC. Uh, thanks for presenting all the evidence uh, from the research side. What I have been reading, especially since Evaldi, is uh, promoting this weapon detecting technology, like, like people in schools are pushing, and especially it was implemented a few weeks back in uh, many of the subway stations, and good amount of budget is being proposed to devote to this uh, gun detection technology, weapon detection technology, and all those things, and I've been uh, there have been talks in schools as well, uh, you know, given that all these other policies, as you said, like implementing one uh, policy alone is not going to result in, in the result or what we are aiming for. So this is one of those policies that I've been hearing a lot. Do you have any say in this? I think that's a great question. And I haven't, I haven't, I don't know the science or the evidence behind that particular policy, though my guess is there's very little evidence around whether something like that works or not. However, I will say this. I think that it's very easy to say, we are going to put all of our money and resources into one or two things that give the impression we are monitoring and surveilling our communities, right? I think that's a really easy response, but I think it actually, like I'll give you some, an example. The New York City Department of Education spends about like $400 million a year on school safety and over half of that budget goes to police and schools. Now, I think a lot of this is what I would call security theater. It's giving the impression that we are doing something without actually addressing the root causes. Like right now in every single state in the United States, under the Elementary Secondary and School Act, if a child brings a firearm to school, doesn't do anything with it, but just brings the firearm to school, which is concerning, under this act, that child has to be expelled from that school for at least one year. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and say to all of you who are members of our teacher community, who are studying health and psychology and children and their well being, what's the fundamental question we are not asking in response to a child bringing a gun to school, which is, well, why did you bring it? What, because there's a lot of research, including some of the work that I have done that has shown that children, adolescents carry a gun because they are, their perception of their environment is one that is unsafe. So if kids fundamentally don't feel safe and they're choosing to carry a firearm because their perception of safety is not there and we are now penalizing them for that, it doesn't get at the root cause of any issue, right? It doesn't get the, at the root cause of the problem. So I think that some of the strategies, like I think, is it reasonable to say in certain spaces before we get on a plane and maybe in other spaces we screen for weapons and things like that? Maybe, I don't think that's an unreasonable ask, but that can't be all we're doing. And I think this is my worry is that we're in, putting all our eggs in one or two baskets without actually considering what is driving some of this violence in the first place? So I don't know if that, hopefully that helps answer your question. That's great. Um, I see. Um, yeah, I think we need to, we, so we could save the rest of the questions for later if that's okay. Um, yeah, we can. I think I can answer this one, this one in the chat real quick if that's helpful. Maybe others have this and then we can, um, just the comparison. I think Ali, you were asking about the, um, comparisons between the US and other countries. So there is gun violence in other countries, but it's a uniquely American issue in that we have such ubiquitous, ac such ubiquitous access to firearms, right? You can't, to quote one of my fellow colleagues here at DC, you can't have gun violence without a gun. So that's why one of the things we really want to make sure we advocate for is reasonable pieces of legislation that would make it harder for, in certain, for certain individuals to get access to guns and more of that we're also really regulating and maybe even banning access to certain types of firearms that we know are particularly deadly. Okay, I'll pause on the questions, go ahead. That's great, thank you. And please do add those questions in the chat, everyone. And we'll have a whole chunk of time towards the end for more questions. 
Uh, Cause more will probably arise. Um, so what I'm hearing is that it's, I think of like an iceberg, you know, in terms of wellness being the 90% of things that happen underneath the surface. And then the 10% that's exposed is kind of the more uh, gun safety type of mechanism. So we're going to focus for the rest of our workshop on that 10% because as you probably know, the Senate has actually released a framework um, to take some action and we're going to support those measures um, in a very, very specific ways. But before that, I do want to just again, thank uh, everyone from TC Generation team who helped make today's uh, event possible on the promotion and, and everything else. Really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I do want to uh, add a word about self-care or even caring for others a little more broadly. This is a hard issue um, uh, emotionally and spiritually. And so we, you know, Teachers College does have resources that I'll drop in the chat. I'm quoting um, uh, President Bailey's message here. Um, and Joey, if you could, uh, let's see, I think I could actually copy these links right now. Um, yeah, Joey, if you wouldn't mind just dropping those links in the chat as, as we're moving on, thank you for that. Uh, Joey Yui, thank you for joining us too. Um, Government Relations Associate, um, who's helping us out today and you could, uh, uh, ask them for any questions you might have. So again, do you wanna acknowledge the difficulty, what's going on in Buffalo in Texas um, several years ago in the Pulse nightclub shooting, really horrific stuff. Um, and you know, I've heard this quote, the antidote to anxiety is action. And so that's why you know, Teachers College has set up TC Take Action. Um, before we jump into the actual action, I want to do what I would consider asset accounting. So that we have 42 people in the room. So clearly some people have taken action already. Some people are experts in their own communities. We want to hear from you. So let me just kind of do a hand raising thing. Uh, you could raise your hand virtually or actually. So just curious who's met with an elected official in any capacity in, the, in, in their lives. Please raise your hand. Stacy Thomas. Urania, Lucia, uh, Elizabeth. I count calling officials, Matt. Uh, uh, no, like actually meet with. Let's start okay. with that kind of like the gold standard. I sat down with an elected official. Um, so I'm seeing uh, Urania. How would you like to share a little bit about how that went? Uh, you should be. Let me. Unmuted. Yeah. Let me unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi everybody, thank you, um, Dr. Rajan Sonali, good to see you. Um, I have met, I would say informally with local, um, local uh, government uh, folks. Harvey Epstein is one, even though I'm not in his district, I feel like I'm an honorary member of the East Village, Lower East Side mm -hmm. community. Um, I think it's, it's important to, for it's important for us to understand what our power is as constituents and share what we can do and also maybe stretch our thresholds a little bit and realize that we can do more than we think. Um, and I think that applies to any any issue, um, but especially this one. And um, Uvalde really uh, affected me a lot. And you know, you want you you ask yourself like, okay, well, what will it take? What will it take? Um, because I think it's important to not become numb to these tragedies. And we have such incredible. Um, resources uh, on campus. And I, I am trying to make an effort to connect our uh, local electeds uh, with Columbia and with TC in particular. So Harvey Epstein is uh, one person that I've been talking to a lot. Mm. Thanks for that. And others, you know, while we're talking, please add in the chat your experience with talking or meeting with elected officials. So we do see um, a, a surprising number of people who've actually sat down with electeds. Um, we're their boss, right? At any moment in time, you've got about a dozen people working for you, your city council member, your community board members, your state assembly member, your state senator, the governor, the mayor, 
uh, your U.S. House rep, this, your two senators, uh, the president, the vice president, I'm running out of fingers. So what's happening is that whether you voted for them or not, you're still their constituent. You still have the right to request a meeting with them. So I encourage everyone to do that. Meet with your legislator. I actually worked for two you different U.S. senators, had those meetings, opened up letters from constituents, and can tell you that it made a difference. Um, so another question. So who's worked on an issue related to this? Who's worked on gun violence prevention in the past? Put your hands up, share your story in the chat. Just curious about the power within this room. Who's worked on, done any kind of work on gun violence prevention? Okay, great, great, great. Sylvia? Sylvia, do you want to share maybe real quick to uh, what what you've done on this issue? Sure. I, I mean, this was in my capacity as a state health department official, but we worked on prevention, the prevention agenda, which is the New York State Public Health Improvement Plan, and what are the priorities in it. And we added because of the constituents that we had. It's a you know the state, sorry, the state health department has a. Um, Public Health Council and members there were interested. So we were able to identify some evidence-based interventions, mm -hmm. some of which you talked about. I mean, New York State has a good set of gun laws, at least we do right this minute until the Supreme Court might take them away, but there's many more things we can be mm -hmm. doing. Investing in place-based initiatives is one of the things we were recommending. So just lo looking at the programs and trying to get some data mm -hmm. behind it, mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. getting people right. to pay attention to it. I love that. And I would just add as like something that I say, I think all the time, and I, when I'm calling elected officials, and I always find it very nerve wracking to do that, but something I say, which, and I say this to my students, my colleagues and I, you know, discuss this, but this is a solvable problem, right? This is something that we could actually address and fix. And in the process of addressing gun violence, we could, if we did all of these things, also improve all sorts of other health and educational and economic outcome. So like the benefit of in trying to fix this would like pays off, will pay, would pay off in spades. We just need to call attention to the best ways to do that. So I just wanted to yeah. underscore that. Yeah, that's, that's such a good point. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I what you raised now is about maybe this kind of intimidation factor of reaching out to elected. And again, um, I think there becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that a lot of people think that reaching out doesn't make a difference, so they don't do it, and therefore it doesn't make a difference. So we want to overcome that. I want to think about this concept of civic muscle and exercising on a regular habit, just like you would your mind, your body, uh, your spirit. And so democracy is not a spectator sport. This is um, something that is only as strong as, as we are um, you know, participating and holding yourself accountable. Another way of accounting, again, for the assets in the room, who has sent letters? Who's done the letter writing or the phone calling in the past to, to your elected reps? Okay, I see more and more hands going up. Another question, who's signed a petition? Any kind of petition, doesn't have to agree around this issue, but petition to your legislator, nice. Nice. So you could see the momentum is growing here. Last question, who's voted? Who's voted before? And uh, and maybe even more than once every four years. So remember those dozen or so officials that we mentioned? They're all running at all different times. We just had some primaries happen, you know, whether in New York City or elsewhere, there's all kinds of elections happening, primaries. And so lots and lots of ways of getting involved. So this again addresses that 90% that's kind of hidden under the wellness things under the surface. It isn't just the once in a generation or once in every 30 years kind of gun you know, safety legislation that we are you know, looking at today. Um, there's so many other ways of taking action. So thank you all for sharing those, um, those experiences with you, with us. Um, okay, so again, back to that 10%, what's happening today? I mentioned the Senate's framework. Um, the Senate's framework uh, for gun um, violence prevention includes um, the red flag laws that Professor mentioned um, that allows uh, law enforcement to temporarily take dangerous weapons away from people who pose a danger to uh, um, others or themselves. Uh, Joey is going to drop a link in the chat for an M to an NPR article that outlines all this what I'm saying verbally. Um, there's billions of proposed new dollars for mental health and school safety. Hooray! 
uh, including money for um, building out uh, community health clinics. Uh, the pr framework proposes to close the boyfriend loophole, so no domestic abuser, spouse, or serious dating partner could buy a gun if they're convicted of abuse against their partner. Um, the, uh, the framework proposes to have the first federal law against gun trafficking and straw purchasing, which is someone buying a gun for you if you're not able to yourself. So closing those loops, loopholes, uh, making it harder for guns to flow into cities, the background check for those under 21, and um, uh, uh, stricter, you know, more clarification for those registering as a gun uh, dealer. So this has bipartisan support, um, and that is not something you hear every day. Uh, so we're going to just jump on that opportunity. We're here to take action, um, and our goal today is to just simply add fuel to the fire to pass common sense gun safety and mental health legislation as outlined in this bipartisan framework. So um, uh, one rule of advocacy or one kind of mantra that I like to follow is don't do it alone. So we are looking um, to other organizations that have been doing this work for decades, like the Brady Campaign, Every Town for Gun Safety, Moms Demand Action, the Newton uh, Initiative, Newtown Initiative, and um, no need to reinvent the wheel. We're uh, echoing um, some of um, what those groups have advocated for. So um, the uh, reason this is important um, is because um, there's real evidence that taking action matters. So I'm gonna offer some quick qualitative and quantitative data. And if you are, we're all advocates in the room. I highly recommend doing that mix of qualitative and quantitative. On the quantitative side, we're already seeing, um, I was reading a New York Times article recently that the reason this framework is, is, exists right now is because Republican and Democratic elected officials have heard from their voters at home. So that's a big part of that. Um, uh, storytelling your personal story is super important. You're gonna take a minute to think about, reflect on who you are, you're an educator, you're a mom, um, and, and why this issue is important to you. I would um, recommend people check out the work of Christina Torres, who's an amazing doctoral student at Teachers College, who does storytelling workshops as a heart of advocacy. Advocacy, you know, the word in Latin means to vocate, right? To speak out, um, finding your voice. Um, again, I did mention um, being on the receiving end of these stories, working uh, in the Senate, opening letters, opening faxes, picking up phone calls. Um, a long time ago, you know, carrier pigeon, however constituents wanted to send in their message, we sat there, we opened them, we listened, we documented those uh, messages from constituents. We sent it to the chief of staff at the end of the day, the chief of staff would tally how many constituents come care about a certain issue, they would send that, share that with the senator, maybe even highlight a specific pithy or 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 salient story um, that the senator could maybe even share with their colleagues who are, um, you know, less inclined to support the issue. So you might be writing to Kirsten Gillibrand today or Chuck Schumer and say, what's the point of preaching to the choir? Well, they're going to take your story, you know, building momentum within among allies, very important rule of advocacy, right? Thinking about building concentric circles, but they're going to take those stories and perhaps share them with their colleagues in, in their house who are a little um, more on the fence. Um, and so that's part of why we're doing this. Quantitative data because I know we're talking to a very intelligent crowd here who's um, interested in research and data. Um, there's a fascinating study, uh, a, a randomized controlled um, st uh, treatment study about a field experiment on how calling your legislator matters. So I hope that people today call, they do emails and tweet. Um, this particular study focuses on calling. And guess what? It moves the needle. And guess what? It doesn't take many phone calls. So that's kind of one of the lessons I want to share today is that for better or for worse, you know, it doesn't take many calls to move a legislator to get them to act. And so um, that's kind of what how the NRA has done its thing for a lot, lot, really long time. And Sonali and I have co-hosted a workshop in the past with Professor Matthew Lacombe from Barnard College. He's part of the Columbia Surge Coalition that Sonali's part of too. 
And he's an expert in an NRA and will, will tell you that it's not actually about the money. You know, we have 40 something people in a room today. Guess what? We're going to be generating at least three calls and letters per person. And that's going to add up to hundreds of uh, noted, you know, messages to Congress. And Matt will tell you, Matthew Lacan will tell you that um, that's kind of what the NRA does. It's it's not, yes, we, we do have a lot of um, powerful lobbies against us, but we're a lobby too. And if anybody's curious about lobbying and should we be doing this, lobbying's not, you know, it has a little bit of cachet attached to it, but lobby is just basically getting the message across. Um, as a 501c3 nonprofit, we could and we should uh, take a stand on the issue. There are actually no limits on, no restrictions on how you could advocate. Uh, lobbying, there are certain thresholds. Um, I could send you more detail on how that works per the IRS, did my dissertation on it. But basically, um, we're here to, 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 to take action. So um, does anybody have any quick questions before we really start doing our letters and phone calls? And I just wanted to note in the context of some of the questions, um, we will point you in the direction of like a set of resources after that I think will hopefully be helpful just as you start to think about your understanding of this and the just what you, things you might want to learn more about and stuff like that. I just wanted to know that I did see some really great questions in the chat. Yeah, and I see a question from Alfred about what is the record of each official funding gun violence reduction programs at community level? Love that question. Um, Joey, maybe we could look into that in the background. Um, you know, maybe some of the advocacy organizations I mentioned earlier do track um, uh, legislators' records. Um, certainly the NRA gives legislators a record A through F. And so um, maybe there's a way of doing that for, for supporting communities. Great question. We'll have more time at the end. Um, just looking at the time here. Okay, so um, here's, we're gonna make it real easy for you. Uh, Teachers College uh, subscribes to Voter Voice, which is a cool software that you've probably seen if you've ever written letters, Sierra Club or Planned Parenthood or any kind of advocacy organization. They generally have, type in your address, pulls up your representative, there's boilerplate, um, language, which you feel free to modify, and then off it goes, you're on record. And then interns like me, uh, or in my past life, would, would open those things up. You will probably, uh, I can almost guarantee, get a letter of confirmation from your legislator saying thank you for that. Okay, so who's ready? Who's ready to take action? Awesome. Okay, looks like we're ready to do this. Okay, so we're going to, uh, Joey, thank you so much for jumping on that. We have a link in the chat and crack it open. Um, and it says pass the bipartisan gun violence prevention package, which we just talked about. And we want you to tell your story. You know, we are um, giving credit to the Brady campaign for much of this language. We didn't modify it too much. And it's really up to you to, um, you know, again, type in your address. Um, it'll find your legislators. And I will pause so you could do this, read it. I know it's hard to listen and read at the same time. So I will zip up in a second. Um, so you could read this and just, you know, it, it details what the package is about, and then it says why it's important, but it's super important for you to say who you are, your constituent, why you passionately believe in this topic. Okay, so any questions before um, I pause? Thanks, Shirley. I think it's amazing, too. Uh, when you're done doing that, and again, not no rush. Uh, when you are done doing that, love to see a little thumbs up in the in your um, <laughs> your virtual um, little thing. I'm doing this with you guys. This is, I actually never done that. It's great. great. Yep. And phone calls too. Um, we'll, we will be calling on people to ask what their experience was if they did a phone call because you might get someone picking up.
How's everyone doing? Starting to see a couple of thumbs up. Yeah, it's great. It's like the most productive three minutes that we just had. It's good. How'd it go, Debbie? It went well. I'm, I was trying to think of a personal story, you know, to add to the beginning of it, but just concern as a mother and a citizen of New York City, I think it's enough. Yeah. <laughs> Should be enough. Something I something I often say, and I'm sure many of you feel this way, but like. I think we all collectively deserve better, right? Like everyone, all of our children, across all of our communities. Like I just think it's sort of a, like a fundamental sort of human right to just be and exist and work mm -hmm. and go to school. And we should be, we should all be able to do that safely. I don't think that's a, I don't actually think that's a <laughs> an overwhelmingly difficult ask. Um, so I think it's, you know, just from even just as a person, it feels like this seems seems reasonable <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah seeing thanks for that uh so i'm seeing some notes in the chat here people finding it easy i will be sharing a report uh at the end to show our national impact which is really exciting it's a little map um so we'll give that a few more minutes um has anybody made a phone call has anybody made a phone call and um spoken with anybody or left a message See Jim with a thumbs up. Uh, Jim, would you like to share how that went? I spoke to someone from Justin Brandon's office and um, they were very receptive. I just told them, you know, after, you know, never mind what just recently happened in Texas, but I was talking of, you know, the, I would say the last two months, there's been a number of guns um, found in New York City schools. And I think um, Professor Rajan is spot on when she says, you know, not that it's right per se, but some of those kids are in fact using them in, mm. as a means of their own protection. But um, they were receptive. They said that they would be bringing it up at the next meeting. Um, another woman whom I have not called yet, but I think would be very receptive to helping on this based on her policies is, um, I might not pronounce her first name right, Mathilda Frontis, um, Coney Island. Okay. Um, I think she's someone that would be an, a, a, a good partner for this as well. Yeah, and don't forget your thank you for that, Jim, and and don't forget your federal legislators too. Uh, this system, again, just to emphasize, is is federal. So this is to Congress where this framework is is existing, and uh, people like Justin Brandon and New York City Council are also good um, to share your message. You know, because um, if you're doing it once, you might as well just echo that message throughout. Um, other people want to put their thumbs up or their hands up to indicate that they've completed this. Little homework assignment, Corinne, thank you. Rachel, um, Rachel, Corinne, uh, do you wanna share um, your experience or if you talked to anybody or how that went? Oh, I don't think I've talked to anyone directly, but I definitely um, have participated in like campaigns and calling, um, you know, after George Floyd um, did a lot of calling for an organization and, um, that it just felt like a small step, but it's just you felt so helpless that mm. something, something to do. So this is really useful. I'm actually going to send your link to our whole team here at CCRC and make sure they can participate in the letter writing campaign. Amazing. Thank you for that. And what you're seeing here before our very eyes, remember just a few minutes ago, we did the hand raising of who's taken action and it wasn't 100%. I think we're getting closer to 100%. Uh, Rachel, would you like to share? Yeah, sure. Hello, my name is Rachel, and I joined this um, today because I'm an incoming doctoral student at TC, so I'm really excited to be here, first of all, but I just felt this desperation as someone who really, I've never called anyone before, I've never sent any letters, I think I felt a lot of anxiety about it, and also, like you said, that self-fulfilling prophecy of, like, what am I going to do, I'm just one person, you know, but definitely after recent events, and I, I was saying in the chat that I got really emotional typing up my message there, and it feels really great to participate in this. Like, I didn't think I would get so emotional through it, but 
Yeah. Like there's hope, you know? Oh my gosh, this is recorded, isn't it? Everyone's going to see me cry, but it's emotional. And yeah. as someone who aspires to become a mother one day, like this hit me so hard. Yeah. So it gives me hope. So I want to say thank you. And I am sending this to my colleagues right now. I work at Wazoo in Seattle, actually. So hello from the uh, West Coast. So um, I'll be sending this to my colleagues at Wazoo at um, Washington University uh -huh. here and try to really spread the word. So this wow. is incredible. <laughs> wow, beautiful. Thank you. That's that's really powerful. Thank you for, for being vulnerable, sharing your, your personal experience and first for getting the word out too. Um, folks, uh, please do spread the message here. Um, <clears throat> uh, it is, it is yeah. I just want to say this. This is like, I think about this issue every single day, <laughs> like probably too much. And it is, it is so, it takes my breath away, I think, sometimes to just see the scope of this. And so just being here and doing this is so, and having a community to do this with, I think is so important. And so I'm just, I think so I'm grateful to y'all because it's a good way to like channel our, it is a really great way, right? To channel like frustration or anger or mm. sadness around this. It's hard to Right, like anybody. I mean, this is this is not a these are not one off events. These this is like a persistent crisis. I just wanted to say I I get it and I I'm with mm. you on the on how challenging this feels. So. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a community effort um, here to support each other. Uh, very warm words, uh, uh, Sonali, Rachel, uh, Linda. Do you have a hand up? Did you want to share anything? Well, we know we know Linda has taken action. <laughs> I oh, have you. done it. Sorry, <laughs> I'm multitasking and yeah. listening. But yes, I did. I did send mine, and so I'm curious to see what kind of response I get. But um, I will also share it with anybody I can. So this is great. Thanks so much, great. Matt and Sonali. Great, thank you. So we'll just give ourselves a couple more minutes um, to make these phone calls, send these emails. Um, I will be sharing a report shortly. I'm seeing um, 59 messages sent, pretty amazing, um, uh, to different parts of the country. So let's keep those going over the next several minutes. Um, I do have an exciting um, link to share, a, a whole bunch of resources um, <clears throat> on um, a landing page that TC just launched on gun violence prevention. Uh, just give me one sec for that, or I think Sarah, if you're still on, we could get that going in the chat. Yeah. Um, Sarah, Sarah, it looks great. Oh my gosh, this whole team is so good. If it's okay, Matt, can I just take a minute to share a little bit what's what's on this site? Please, please do, yeah. Um, um, so just for all of you, this is a, I think Sarah, we call it a micro site, um, but sort of like a site that lives within the TC website world. But it's there and we're going to add to it um, right now. I don't, we didn't add the, the um, links to papers yet that my colleagues and I have written and others, but we will over the next you know few weeks. But in the meantime, it's in the chat right now. But if you take, if you just want to scroll through it at some point, there's lots of different resources and different ways. One thing I, this is just a little selfishly, but I think might be of interest is, um, one of the links here is um, if you scroll through on the bottom, there's sort of different icons um, with different pictures. And one of them links to a podcast series that my colleagues and I um, produced last year. It's a six episode series devoted to out of the box, creative, but evidence informed solutions to the persistence of gun violence. And I'm so proud of it, but also because I think it really makes a lot of the existing research just really accessible. So we try to tell a story with each episode, which is about like 25 minutes long. And I think it's, I don't I'm a, I love podcasts. I listen to them when I go running. So for me, this is like a nice thing. So if you're a podcast person, you can add it to your queue. And it's again, it's six episodes. And I would just encourage you to listen. It's something like I've shared it like with my mother-in-law and <laughs> my friends. And it's just one of those things for people who like folks, even if you're not in the space or at TC, you can listen to it. And it, it includes the voices of researchers across Columbia University, but also at other institutions, community partners, et cetera. So I just wanted to call attention to that um, on this site. And then also just other links, um, other advocacy organizations that are doing 
a lot of this on the ground work, um, mental health oriented resources, um, some educational oriented resources, um, you know, so, oh, the podcast is, um, well, I'll tell you, it's research for solutions. Um, I'll, I'll put the link it's linked. Um, I'll put it, I'll put a link to it on, um, the chat as well, but it's also linked to on this microsite. Um, so let me put this in the chat, but I think, um, there you go. It's right in the chat. So it's research for solutions. I don't know if you get it. We're searching for solutions, you guys. Okay. And we produced it here at TC, uh, just this amazing team of folks who pulled this together um, through the Media and Social Change Lab. Yeah. Um, but I think if you're trying to explain or distill down a set of ideas, hopefully in like a clear way, I think we kind of tackle different perspectives on each of these six episodes. So um, just encourage you guys to take a listen to that. Um, okay, I'll stop with my plug on that, but just wanted to bring your attention to some of some of what's on this site. That's amazing. Thank you for that. Yeah. And and another medium, you know, of storytelling via podcast, so important to be able to translate this research to um, not just the general public, to, but to policymakers. Again, like having having sat, you know, uh, in, in this, these Senate offices, um, the staff do a lot of the work they um, have to digest tons of data from tons of constituents and interest groups, and they need to quickly build their expertise. So you are you are you are the expert. Right? You have on the ground community um, uh, experience, whether you're an educator, citizen, taxpayer, voter, um, or a doctoral student or master's student. So um, don't hesitate to share your stories with those with those folks. So I'm going to show just a quick preview of the outcomes of what we just did. Um, <clears throat> so I've got uh, some insights here um, on voter voice, the back end here, we see 65 messages sent, amazing. 19 new advocates and returning advocates and um, New York, Virginia, Massachusetts. And we see uh, messages going out 20 to Schumer, Gillibrand, Espaillat, Nad Nadler, Bauman, Neil, Markey, Warren, you know, so people are in Virginia. So we are having uh, impact. You can see the little map in multiple places. Um, we did have another uh, earlier campaign on uh, the background check that was embedded in um, a newsletter that went over uh, via President Bailey right when the, the Texas shooting happened. And um, I'll just show you that real quick. And that we had, I think, 102 messages go out to Texas, Illinois, um, Ohio, Virginia, Northeastern states, California. So um, the background check bill was what the major advocacy groups were focusing on for a while. And then now, obviously, the framework is the, um, the policy de, de jour. Uh, we're doing pretty well on time. Um, again, take your time to fill out those messages make those phone calls. I saw a couple social media messages go out. Um, Want to kind of open up the floor a little bit more so you have an opportunity to, again, share experience, ask questions. Uh, there, we've been dropping lots of resources your way. Don't, don't want to overwhelm. So now is a moment you as the audience could take to um, find your voice, to share your experience, to ask us questions. Take it away. I was going to share a meme. I was kind of like hesitating. It's, um, well, maybe I'll just post it. It's, it's one of those things that's like funny, not funny. It's a picture. Maybe some of you have seen it, but it shows, you know, normally at kids at graduation. So it shows them throwing their, um, um, it, it shows, it shows them throwing their, um, uh, you know, college, I'm sorry, caps in the air. And there's a, there's a meme on Facebook going around that shows these kids throwing their, um, uh, bulletproof vests. I don't, it's not funny, but I wonder if it's, I'll, I'll post just because I think it's, it does send a message. Does that make sense? It totally does, uh, Jim. Okay. And I think, I've, I think I've seen this and it does. I think it speaks to the ways in which we are sort of inclined as a society to react to what we see, which mm -hmm. is to say, okay, let's do something. Let's do anything, right? There's like almost a desperation there, of course. Like we, we yes. want to prevent this. But that it's like, 
the hard work of preventing this in the first place requires attention well before we have these credible threats to school communities and, and other places. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so Jim, I appreciate you bringing that up. because I think, I, I think I know you're talking about it and I've, um, I've seen versions of that going around, so. Yeah, and just to add to that, you know, another mode or medium of communication, art or editorials, drawings, if you are an artist, you have a lot of power, political power to, to get your um, word out there. I know uh, actually Urania, uh, we've collaborated and connected with artists in the past to um, do some amazing work, you know, pro supporting democracy, uh, drawing attention to important issues. So uh, if you're an artist, a writer, you have talents that are accessible in this, in this heavy lift, you know, in this uphill battle um, to um, have better gun violence prevention. Yeah, Matt, I was just going to say, maybe it's time for to invite the Illuminator mm. project back. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, what a great organization. So if you if you go to tc.ed slash advocacy, I'll put that link there, you'll see what the Illuminator uh, Collective did. They actually had this um, giant projector and had a rotating series of images outside TC at night when we kind of launched the TC Take Action Advocacy Academy initiative several years ago. Um, so thanks for that shout out. Um, others uh, with questions or observations? Okay, so from here, I think we can um, kind of continue our skill share and start to wrap up. Basically, curious what other forms of action people have taken. We mentioned letter writing, um, <clears throat> artistic endeavors, podcasting. Can um, I ask? Are, yeah, can please. Can I ask a question? Did anyone um, go to one, like the March for Our Lives or has mm. anyone done anything like that? Um, either on this issue or maybe other issues in the past couple of years? Any of the protests or marches? Right. Just kind of curious around interest on that. I'm also curious about when the next one is. Do we know of any other uh, marches occurring? There were a couple that happened recently. Uh, if anybody knows of any upcoming events or petitions, this is the time to share it with the group. I'm wondering, Matt and Sarah, maybe we can um, also add that to the site if we're able, depending on, like if people want to look for anything that's local to where you are, mm. you could add that, you could sort of add and crowdsource on, on the website. So. I just want to add. Um, yeah, go ahead, Alfred. I've been mouthing off on my uh, youth perspective. Uh, there's a, a collaborative that's been organized out of uh, CUNY's uh, School of Professional Studies that's called uh, uh, Social Policy, Youth Policy. And it's actually a collaborative of leadership groups that are comprised of teens that are leading organizations and have adult mentors on issues that are of importance to them. And they recently did a, a town hall meeting at City Hall and gave presentations to the Chancellor of the Board of Ed, to borough presidents and some of the local council people. So if people are working uh, either by themselves as individual you know, public citizens or in groups you know, for reducing gun violence, my recommendation would be to, to reach out to this collaborative at, at uh, the CUNY, CUNY School of Professional Studies. Uh, Dr. Sarah Zella Berkman is the coordinator of that study. And uh, maybe there could be some mentoring partnerships because youth feel especially, obviously at risk uh, of violence both in and out of the schools and being able to partner with organizations that have such rich experience that we all have may uh, lend cred to the issue in the youth community itself. Thank you so much for that, Alfred. Yeah, if, if you are able to find a link um, over the next few minutes, that'd be great to share with the group. 
Um, I love what's happening in the chat. I'm seeing connections happening uh, among people who are, you know, wanting to go to uh, take action together, go to marches and things. Um, this is a great opportunity to find a group of um, <clears throat> willing kind of allies uh, to get together. Maybe uh, TC, you know, could organize something or maybe there could be a grassroots kind of um, effort to continue this conversation. And that's kind of how um, over the next few minutes, I kind of want to uh, wrap things up is thinking about how do we continue the conversation. So again, sharing this, the voter voice link is one way of doing it. Staying in touch with people in the room is another way. Um, kind of, again, crowdsourcing other ways of taking action. Um, thanks, Joey. Yeah, there's a lot. This is Pride Month. So um, there's lots of uh, Pride activities happening. We actually do have a uh, LGBTQIA uh, Take Action Workshop coming up in June 28th. Um, so you're the first to know. Uh, we will have uh, a link circulated shortly. Um, uh, on, uh, regarding the Equity Act, we'll be using voter voice again. And so uh, thanks, uh, I see offered for uh, Y Vote, great. Yeah, so y, y Vote is a great group, um, lots of um, uh, cross-pollination um, with, with Pride. You know, we did mention the Pulse um, tragedy uh, not that long ago. So um, let's continue to build power. Any, anybody else want to jump in? Any thoughts about next steps? I'm gonna put my email in the chat. Um, and so folks are always welcome to reach out with ideas. Um, I do just, I'm gonna just make a little plug for something, but I think this might be of interest to our students here. So my colleagues and I started a couple of years ago, something called the Columbia Scientific Union for the Reduction of Gun Violence. We call it Columbia Surge for short. Um, but every fall, our, we have a, just an amazing group of students who organize what we call um, Gun Violence Action Week. And it's a week of events um, that we do panels and um, trainings and kind of try to capture speakers and, and perspectives on this issue. It's primarily student-led with um, a couple of us faculty providing some guidance around the setup of it. Um, we're just getting that kind of process going again for this fall, but uh, if there's interest in being a part of that or um, certainly coming to the, those events in the fall, I will um, we'll be sure to promote it you know, across our TC channels, but feel free to email me if something like that seems just like something you might want to be involved in. Okay, so I just wanted to put that out there. Definitely, yeah, really robust group here, um, <clears throat> Teachers College in Columbia main campus um, doing the research um, called Surge. So thanks for that shout out. I'll drop in my email as well. Um, that I last link didn't work. The last link, uh, okay. I'm sorry to interrupt, but that last link didn't yeah. take. It looks like there was an extra change duh, instead of change, perhaps. Um, yeah, I think if you drop the D and change, that, that should do the trick. Um, yeah, so our emails are available um, for further discussion, ideas, workshops. We're here to uplift and to um, echo you know, the work that you're already doing, your communities. We need to hear from you. You know, We need to to know what are what's what's the qualitative and quantitative data data you know happening in your community, um, so I think we'll start to wrap up. Uh, last chance for folks to um, share uh, any thoughts about how this went or you know ideas for the future. So, okay, we're up to 73 messages sent. We could pat ourselves on the back. A really incredible uh, show of force here. Um, you could rest assured that you have done something important and that your uh, legislators who work for you uh, have now officially heard from you. So congrats, and we look forward to doing this work with you again in the future. Thank you again, Professor, and 
Joey, everybody in the room today. Thank Great you. to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Great to see Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Madden Sonali. Thank you so much. Great seeing you. Great to see bye you bye. all. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Yeah.